In this video, I'm going to cover the basics of processing 1D NMR data with Mestranova. In order to do this, you already need to have Mestranova installed on your computer and your data transferred onto your computer. There are other videos that cover how to do this. Once you have Mestranova open and running, you can open the data set by finding the folder that contains the data and dragging it onto Mestranova and should open up automatically. Another way you can do it is you can go to the File Open menu and you can find the data on your computer and you want to open the file FID. Some 2D data sets are called SER, but it's either going to be FID or SER and this is the file you want to open. You need all these other files though, there are additional parts of the data, but FID is the one you want to open. So there we've opened another copy of it. On some instruments, the data will be in numbered folders, and these are the ones that you want to drag onto Mestanova to open the data. Okay, once you've got the data open, you can see if you have multiple spectra open, you'll see them as separate pages here. And Mestanova is designed to look and act a lot like PowerPoint. So whichever page you select will be represented in a larger form here. And you can also do things in, like you can do in PowerPoint. You could add text or graphics. This can help you display the data that, the way that you want. OK, so we're just going to focus on this first spectrum right here. I'm going to, for now, just leave the other ones alone. I'll get rid of this one by highlighting it and selecting Delete and remove it from the document. But it doesn't delete the data from, the, from your computer. OK, so looking at this first one, we're going to go through the basics of processing. And basically, you want to start at the left-hand side of this toolbar here and then move to the right. So Mestanova has already Fourier transformed and autophased this data set. In many cases, this works well. Like on this spectrum, it's fine. But on this particular one, it's not been phased very well automatically. So we're going to have to fix that manually. But before we get to that, I'm going to cover a few basics about how the data is collected, just so you know what you're looking at. So we collect the data as a free induction decay, or an FID. It looks like this. It's a time domain data set. And the data is actually a bunch of sinusoidal oscillations, which are very hard to interpret as a person. So what we're going to do is, first we're going to apply some sort of weighting function to this data. That's known as appetization. I will go into this a little bit more detail later. So going from the original FID to the processed FID has had the weighting function applied and zero filling applied if, if you are going to do that. And then after this, we are going to do the Fourier transform and you'll get a spectrum that looks like this. And now the scale is in frequency domain, which we can change here you can see so hertz or ppm are frequency domain units. So now we get these peaks, which are much easier to interpret rather than the sinusoids, which are much more difficult to interpret. ppm is standard for NMR because it's independent of the field strength that you're using. So you can compare data from a 300 megahertz NMR to a 500 and so forth. OK, so we've got the Fourier transform data. Next thing we want to do is adjust the phasing if it's necessary. I can tell that this spectrum is not phased correctly because the line shapes do not look like I expect. So to do that, to fix it, I'm going to go to this phase correction menu and select manual correction. This window comes up and this box right here is what it's talking about for click here. So we need to click inside this box and drag the mouse up or down. And it says left button will do the zero order phase correction and right button will do the first order phase correction. You also see that this line appears, which is the pivot point. We can use this slider here to adjust the pivot point. Normally, we want to set the pivot point to some peak in the spectrum, either at the right-hand edge or the left-hand edge of the spectrum, although it doesn't really matter where you set it, as long as you know what you're doing. We'll put it on this one. And then we're going to adjust the zero order phase correction and try to fix the phasing on the spectrum. So I'm going to click the left mouse button in the box and drag it up and down to adjust the phasing. So you can see this is what I expect for an in-phase spectrum. This is something that's 90 degrees out of phase, roughly. If it's upside down, then it's 180 degrees out of phase. This would be 270, and then we're back to in-phase. OK, so that's pretty good. But um, if I zoom in a bit by increasing the vertical scale, which I can do either by clicking on this plus button here, it'll step it up. Or if you have a middle mouse wheel, you can 
roll the wheel up and adjust the vertical scale like that with the mouse wheel. So I'm now going to go back and look at this. And now it looked pretty good, but it's actually out a little bit. This one is almost good. I'm going to finish tweaking that one up with the zero order phase correction. So that one looks perfect. But now we can see some of these other ones aren't perfect. And if I fix one of the other ones with the zero order, this one looks bad. So we can't fix them all simultaneously. That's why we need the first order phase correction. So I'm going to use the right mouse button and adjust the first order phase correction. And you can see that the first order phase correction affects the entire spectrum, but leaves the peak at the pivot point alone. It actually has an increasing effect as we move away from the pivot point and no effect at the pivot point. So with this, we can fix all of the peaks and now everything looks like it's in phase. We can do this with any peak we want. So if this was where our pivot point was, then we could adjust the, the phasing for the first order phasing on every other peak. So what we want is all of the peaks to look absorptive, which means that they are all positive, unless you have an experiment where you expect the peaks to be positive and negative or, or something else. But to me, this looks pretty good. So I'm going to say the phasing is, is good. So I'm going to close this. The next step, as we can see here, is baseline correction. Now, the baseline on this spectrum looks pretty good. It's all relatively flat. But there is a problem. If I really zoom up, you can see that this is 0 on the, on the vertical scale. And the baseline is actually not centered at 0. This is a pretty common problem. This is part of the way that the data is collected on the instrument. There will be minor uh, deviations from 0 on the baseline. Um, if you're going to integrate your spectrum and use the integrals, you definitely should do baseline correction because any problems with the baseline, like this offset, will add or subtract from your integrals and it will mess up the resulting values. So to do baseline correction, we can go in here to the baseline correction menu. And you can see that there's a lot of options in here. For example, Whitaker Smoother which is a very aggressive baseline correction algorithm. You can see it's actually fitting some of the real part of the peak. And that will remove some real data from your spectrum, which is always a concern with baseline correction. So uh, this might be a little too aggressive. Make the spectrum look nice, but it might be removing real uh, important information. Polynomial fit is a much more conservative form of baseline correction. This filter corresponds to the width that it uses to remove data that it considers a peak. So what it wants to do is fit only the baseline and ignore the peaks. What you wouldn't want is for this baseline to try to go up and down through the peaks. So this filter, the wider it's set, the broader of a feature in the spectrum that it will assume is a peak and ignore from the spectrum. Normally, the auto detect works pretty well. Now, you can change the order of the polynomial, but just beware if you get too high order, you can start to get some crazy oscillations and again, start removing real information or actually make the data look worse rather than better. So normally a reasonable option is a fairly low order polynomial, like a second or third order polynomial. For this one, we'll use a third order polynomial and then we'll, oh, I can cover one other thing. The Bernstein polynomial is another form of polynomial that's related to the Fourier transform. You can try it if you wish. Um, sometimes it works pretty well without any additional parameters. OK, so we're going to use a regular third order polynomial with the auto detect filter and apply it. And what you can see is now that the baseline is centered at 0. And if there was any waviness in the, in the baseline or some other imperfections, one that's very common on some instruments is something we refer to as a smile sometimes. You can see that the edges of the baseline go up. This is not real information. This has to do with the way that the data is filtered. So you can see that with this, if we use something like the Whitaker Smoother, it will fit the edges of the smile and remove them from the, from the data set. OK, back to this spectrum. We have done the phasing. We've done the baseline correction, the next thing we can do is referencing. Now it says TMS. So one way that you can do referencing is if, if you have TMS in your spectrum, which is tetramethylsilane, it should be set at 0 ppm. So we can zoom in by using the magnifying glass here on a peak that we want to use as a reference. And you might see that it's not exactly 
at the location it should be. So what we can do is click on this reference button, find the peak, and then set it to whatever value it should be. For example, 0 ppm. Another way to do referencing is to use the solvent signal. So if there's a residual signal from your deuterated solvent, residual protons in your solvent, you could use this as well. So you could find this signal, select it, and then there's a table of a lot of common solvents here. So in this case, it's chloroform. There's the residual proton shift of chloroform. You can select that and apply it. And now we're referenced using chloroform. You can see that these two didn't match exactly. That may be due to concentration effects. When you dissolve different materials in solvents at different concentrations, it can have slight effects on the chemical shift. As long as you reference consistently, it should not be a problem. OK, now we have our spectrum referenced. Next thing we can do is peak picking. Now, automatic may work reasonably well, but a reasonable way to do it is with a manual threshold. So what we do is select the manual threshold, and we're going to draw a line and everything above or below the line, if you had negative peaks, will be selected as a peak. Anything that is inside these two lines here will be ignored and considered either you know, a minor peak that you don't care about or part of the baseline. Because if you had too much here, you could have thousands and thousands of peaks, and that would not be very easy to interpret. We just want to focus on these main peaks here. So we're going to set the threshold so that we just pick the main peaks. So it should pick just that one, that one, that one, and that one. And there we go. We can see actually that this peak is more than one peak, even though on this view it looks like one. So if we zoom in here, we can see that there's more than one peak picked. Now this may have to do with shimming or other issues. So if, uh, if you have bad, uh, shimming on your spectrum or if you have uh, impurities and you don't want to analyze them at this point then just make sure that you set the threshold to a level that's higher than what uh, those peaks are. So let's go back in here and try to do that. I'm going to do manual threshold and just set it at the very top here of these. Now we get one peak per each. OK, next thing is integration. This button here will get us back to the full view of the spectrum. Now often, if you have the peaks picked correctly, you can just go into the auto detect regions, and it should do a reasonably good job uh, setting the integrals for you. However, if you want to adjust it manually, you can go in and you could manually integrate a region. So I could just pick a region here and then that would be the integral of that. And you can see that there's always some value of the integral because even just noise will integrate to something. Although I did look like I found some sort of a peak there. You can also adjust the edges of the integral if they aren't exactly where you want them. And normally you want to have the integrals and you can also delete them by right clicking and selecting delete integral. Normally you want to have the integrals cover your entire peak, but not anything extra. So we know that this is solvent here, whereas this is our peak. So I could go in and adjust the edge of the integral so that it covers the entire peak, but nothing extra. And again, as long as you're consistent, it should be reasonable. These peaks here are the C13 satellite peaks. They will have an expected 1% of the value of this main peak here. Again, as long as you're consistent, you should be able to have accurate integrals. Once you've got the spectrum integrated, then you could go in and normalize it. You can go there by right-clicking on it, on the integral. Go to Edit Integral, and you can pick which integral that you're editing. So I'm going to choose this one, for example, and set it to 3. And it will update all of the other values to be 
based on that integral. Okay, once we've got um, all our integrals set, then we can move on to the next step, which in this case, there is not much to see because each one of these peaks is a singlet. But in some spectra, you will have multiplets. So we'll move on to this spectrum here that has a lot of peaks. This is quinidine. And we'll go back in and reprocess it. So let's just do the baseline. We already did the baseline correction. Let's do referencing on uh, TMS here. On chloroform, I mean. And let's see what it does with the automatic peak picking. It's going to pick a lot of things. It tries to figure out what is a real peak and what is not, but it may or may not do an accurate job of that. And it can take a little while. Okay, it picked a lot of peaks. However, it did not pick some other peaks. Anyway, that's not important for this point right now because now we're going to go in and do multiplet analysis. So if we see a series of peaks like this, it's actually um, one proton that's been split into many different peaks by its J couplings to other protons. And one way you could try to estimate what the size of those J couplings are is by measuring the distance on the spectrum, which you can do with these crosshairs. And then you could see what the value is over here on this table. But another way that you could do it is to go in and do multiplet analysis. So this is this button with J here. And we will do manual multiplet analysis for now. And what I want to do is, it's just like picking peaks. I'm going to highlight the peaks that I want to analyze. And if it works correctly, it will say, this is a doublet of doublet of doublets. So this means that this is one proton that has been split by a coupling to three different protons. But each different proton has a different intensity of its J coupling. So we get this crazy pattern like this. It can be very difficult to extract out what those J couplings are by hand. But now if we go into View, Tables, Multiplets, we can see that the J couplings have been extracted from that multiplet. So this proton is coupled to three other protons with J coupling of 7.6, 10.4, and 17.1. Now you could go in and do it by hand on each one, or you could do the entire spectrum, although you need to be careful that it's actually doing an accurate job. You want to go through and verify everything, because it's not as smart as a person is. And once it's done the whole spectrum, if you're happy with the way it is, then you can go back to this view tables multiplets. And you will see that there is a report here. This report is suitable for what you would paste into the experimental section of many uh, papers. And if you want to, you can go in and set it up in the format for whatever journal that you're going to be sending it to. And it will adjust the uh, format accordingly. Um, this can save a lot of time because there's a lot of italics, bolds, etc. needed in there. So you can just uh, highlight that and copy it into your paper, assuming that all the data is correct. Okay, this concludes the basics of processing 1D NMR data. For more information, you can go into the help contents and you can look at the fast visual guide to process routine 1D NMR data sets. It covers many of these same points.